So today marks our first day of SOL review, like I said. Um, if you look at your assignment sheet, let me go and pull that up so we can take a look at it together. Which paper? Number one? Okay, I'll get you another one. Where did it go? Ah. Okay, so let's take a look at our assignment sheet together so you can kind of see the idea of what we're doing between now and the SOL. All right, so remember your SOL is on May 26th. That's on a... Okay, you guys are Thursday. Yeah, Thursday, May 26th. Um, actually, it's not. That's when school starts. That's first block. So we do have our, the math SOLs are always in the morning, so they will start right at 810. Um, make sure you get there early. So when you get off the bus, put your stuff in your locker and then go straight to your testing location. You will not report here. All right? So can you bring it? Um, I mean, you have classes later on, so make sure you have your materials for your other classes. If you need a place to put your backpack, you can put it in our classroom, um, but we'll discuss as we get closer to the date. All right, so anyways, you did number two for homework last night, and we're going to, we basically have about one, two, three, four days of review before we take our practice SOL test in here, and remember that counts as a test grade for fourth quarter. So today we're going to focus on functions, um, domain, range, intercepts, is it a function, uh, things like that. And then we are also learning about statistics, box, and whisker plots. So we're going to be doing some stats today and next class, um, as well as reviewing. So then next class we're going to talk about standard deviation variation, that's our second stat topic. And then solving equations and equalities, this includes system of equations. And then the following class will review exponents and radicals. And the following class after that is quadratic. So we've kind of taken the topics and break, broken them down between these four days. We are also going to take a look at a practice SOL test which you have in front of you. Look something like this. These types of questions, you have four per page. This is actually an SOL that they released for us to use as practice. We will do this throughout our different classes, just picking different problems and doing those. So make sure you keep on track of what homework you have. Remember that you have JLab still due. So you should have already completed two different 10-question JLabs. Your next JLab is a 20-question JLab, and that is due next class, next Tuesday. And keep in mind, you do need to take a 40-question JLab that counts as a test, and that is due May 16th. So that's in uh, about a week and a half. Um, remember that you can retake these JLabs as many times as you want. Just send us the score that you want recorded. Um, so if you plan on retaking your 40-question JLab test multiple times, I'd recommend you start doing that now so that you don't get to the night before and then not have enough time to do it. All right. Um, we will take a practice SOL test in class that counts as an actual test grade for fourth quarter, and then we will immediately go over that the next two classes. Any questions? Yes, Jason. Yes, you have finals, hopefully for all your classes, definitely your core classes. Um, after we do our SOL, yes. after you take your SOL, we will do quadratic formula and... Three, four, five. Three, four, five? Yes. Three inches down, three inches. Up, oh, yeah, that's a right triangle. Yeah. yeah. See? Yeah. yeah. Good work. I didn't see one in the class. Thank you. Bye, Scotland. Okay, so after our, our SOL test, we will take, we will learn the second part of Unit 11. Unit 11, remember, we split into two parts. You took the first part of the test yesterday. The remaining two pieces are quadratic formula and how to graph quadratics. We'll be doing that after the SOL, and then we will have, uh, depend on time, maybe some intro to geometry, and then final exam review in our final, because geometry is the next class. All right, so finals are somewhere around here. I don't remember which day ours is, but we'll talk about those when we get closer to it. Other questions? Okay. Uh, I don't think so. All right. 
So let's go ahead and pull out worksheet one. Again, this is something that you've already done for homework, but we haven't started going over it yet. And this is SO review. So we're going to start off by going over this. If you did not have it with you, and you just now get a copy, work through it with us and fill it out with us. Okay. So first, let's talk about functions. Remember, for functions, x values cannot repeat. So for functions, we, in order to test to know if it is a function, do you remember what we use? For example, this first problem here says, which of the following graphs appear to be a function? Does anybody remember what it is that we use? Yeah, the vertical line test. You want to take your pencil and go across, and if it passes through at two points at the same time, it is not a function. So I want you to write that at the top there. Vertical oh, line test. Yeah. A vertical line test. So what we do is we draw a vertical line. <coughs> And then we pass this through. That doesn't work. This one doesn't work, right? So this is not a function. All right, test our next one. That one's also not a function. All right, let's test our other ones over here. For this one. Yeah, that one works, right? That one on the what about our last one down here? So then when we move the line down here, this one is not a function. So this is a typical SOL type of question. All I have to do is remember to use your vertical line test. So our answer here would have been, it asks which one is a function. Let's use this guy here. Make sure you're careful to read the instructions because they love to throw in the word not. Make sure you are reading to know what they're asking for. Over these next four days, we're just going to pretty much be um, giving you some pointers as to how to best take this SOL exam. You can not understand a question and use your calculator to help you answer a lot of them. Okay. Any questions on that first one? Alright, moving on. Next it says, which appears to be the range of the function, or of the relation. What does it mean to be a range? What's the range? Y values. Very good, our y values. Now here for this one, we have just a bunch of different dots. So our y values are going to be individual values we list. All right. So when we look here, we want to just list our y values. Now remember, we're talking about y, so it should be y such that. So which ones can we immediately eliminate? <coughs> Our x is good. So we're already down to just two prob or two answer choices here. Use that process of elimination. Remember on the SOL, you have that x, the red x, that allows you to mark off answers you know are incorrect. Yeah. All right. So taking a look at my graph here, what's the y value here? So I'm just going to start from the bottom going up to the top. So what's this guy? Good. This one? Good. Good. And our last one? Alright, so which answer choice is that? Good. Now notice we are listing each individual dot because they're individual points. When it's a smooth and connected line, like this one down here, that's when you have your inequalities, mm -hmm. all right? When they're individual dots, that's when you list each individual point here. Okay, so the next question says, what appears to be the domain? So we said the range are our y values. What's the domain? X values, good. So now I'm going to look here. Do I have individual points? No. No, so I should not have a list. I should not have a list like C was up here. <laughs> okay? 
Now, let's take a look at what we have. My x values go from left to right. right? My y values are up and down, x values are left and right. Well, what do we notice about our graph here? What do we notice about the x? They have arrows. What does that mean it's going to do? Continue forever and ever and ever. Forever to the left, forever up, forever up, forever to the right. If it's forever going to the left and forever going to the right, what is it going to be? All real numbers. It's everything. If it was all real numbers greater than negative 1, then your graph would only be everything over here. If it was all real numbers greater than 2, your graph would only be everything over here. If it was all real numbers less than 10, it would only be everything whoops, that way. But we have it goes in both directions, so we need all of that. Good. All right, that side. The following graph shows a relation. Which of the following best describes the range of this relation? All right, so range. Again, is that x or y values? Thank you, Jason. I'm hoping everyone is knowing this. Yeah. Range are the what? I want to hear everyone. Why? I only heard Freddie that time. Range are which ones? Jason, which range? Why? I want to hear every single person. I'm not going to move on until everyone says why. Range is what? Why? Why? Rachel, I did not hear you. Range is what? Why? We must have our y values here. Remember, guys, it's alphabetical. F comes before y in the alphabet, G comes before R in the alphabet. All right, y is from bottom to top. So starting at the bottom, where does my graph start? Right here. What is my y value there? Negative 4. All right, is y above it or below? Does it continue above or below? Above. So would you agree with me that y has to be greater than or equal to negative 4? Yeah, the line is solid. The line is solid, very good. So which of these answer choices would that match? Mm -hmm. Good, everything greater than. Awesome. All right, so again, these are typical SOL questions. We are right now teaching you how to beast this SOL. All right, next, it says which number is not an element in the domain. Which one are your domain values? Domain are my x values. So let's circle them. Negative 2, 0, 1, and 6. So which answer choice is not in your domain? A. A. Number 4. All right. Now, this is the trickier type of question they'll give you with this. It says, find the values of f of x equal to 9x squared plus 1 for the domain values of negative 3 and 6. All right, so negative 3 and 6. Domain, again, are your x values. So what they have given you are two x values. They've given you negative 3 for x, and they've given you 6 for x. It's listed in those curly braces, which means it's a list. It's not an ordered pair. That's how we know it's not x and y. So if they give me that x is in my domain, how am I going to find my range value for it? How am I going to find the y value for it? Put it in. Yeah. F of x is the same thing as y, so all I have to do is take negative 3 and put this in for x. All right, so I want you to punch this in your calculator. I want everyone in their calculator. You should be using your calculator to check just about every single problem on that SOL. Well. When we take negative 3 and put it in, we get 82. Now let's take 6 and put it in. Alright, put that in your calculator and let's see what you get. Make 
make sure you use parentheses where there are parentheses. Was there any ones that when they did the first one, they got negative 80? Okay. All right, what do we get for this? 325. 325? Do we agree? Okay, so our answers are 82 comma 325. Now they like to do those, what they call technology enhanced questions. This would be an example of a technology enhanced question where it's not multiple choice and they would make you type in your answers. Okay. All right, questions on worksheet one. All right, let's take a look now through worksheet two. So this is what your homework was. A lot with slope and lines, finding your slope, writing the equation of a line, writing the equation of a line given two points, writing the equation of a line given the slope, writing the equation of a line given the point, and the slope. So we need to concentrate on our y equals mx plus b and our slope formula. Yes, Jason. Can I get a copy of that? Yeah. It's actually, if you go over in the bin, where it says worksheet. All right, so our slope equation is rise over run. So if it's on a graph, we can just finger count. Um, but otherwise, it's subtract your y's divided by your x's subtract. All right, and remember, our equation line here is y equals mx plus b. Which aspect of this is the slope? Which variable represents your slope? The, the m. m. Very good, Adrian. And which one represents your y-intercept? Good, B. The way I always like to remember the slope is not the slope, but the Yeah, that's a good one. All right, so in order to figure out what my slope is, I need to get it in this form. Because right now, what a lot of you have done in times past is you just said 3 was your slope, because that's what was in front of x. But that's not the case. It has to be in the form y equals mx plus b. So I need to get y by itself. All right, so what's going to be my first step? Uh, okay, Jason, go ahead. Good, subtract 3x. So I have 2y equals negative 3x plus 36. Again, we write our x first. And... Okay, what's going to be my next step? Very good. Divide by 2. Remember, we need to do our heart here. Alright, so we get y equals negative 3 halves x plus 18. So what is my slope? Good. Negative three halves, not negative three halves x, just the very or just the coefficient in front. So my slope is negative three halves. Okay. All right. For sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and move on since this is a very similar problem here. All right. So this next one says find the slope of the given equation. All right. So we have y equals two times parentheses x minus four plus three. Brian, what do you think we're going to do for our first step here? What are your thoughts? Good. Distribute. I need to get it in this form, mx plus b. And right now, there's parentheses around that x. So we need to distribute this out. And we get 2x is minus 8 plus 3. Right, still not quite in that form. Jason Panato, what should I do next? Good. Combine like terms. And what can I combine together? Very good. Negative 8 and 3. Now, some of you are still making the mistake where instead of just combining these together, you're saying plus 8 plus 8. We only do the opposite when we are crossing that equal sign. Because if you were to suddenly add 8 twice to just one side of the equation, you have now no longer made it equal because you suddenly just added 16 to one side, but not the other side. So it's no longer equal. So we aren't doing the opposite here. We're just combining it. What would negative 8 plus 3 give me? Good. So I have y equals 2x. That's fine. All right. What's my slope here? 2. Very good. All right. Questions on that one? All right. I want to see on a scale of... One to five. 
how you feel with this material so far. Where one is not good, but five is this is awesome. I'm so glad that I know this stuff. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so let's just do one of these where it passes through two points. Um, we'll just continue on the left side here. Okay, so they gave us two points. What's our formula? How do we find slope when they give us two points? Very good. Slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. All right, again, if it helps you out, label one of your points as the first one, the other one is your second, because you have to go in the same order. The biggest mistakes I see here is that people will flip-flop their x and y values, or they'll put x on top rather than y, or they will start off with the second one, and then the next time they'll start off with the first one. Okay, so for our equation here, 9 minus 1 over 6 minus 8. Again, you have a calculator the full s of y, so you just have to check your math. Right now I see that this is 8, and negative 2, but double check, because especially when it comes to negatives, we see a lot of mistakes. So punch those in your calculator. You have the whole day you can use on the S of all. Utilize the puppy. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest benefits is labeling your points. If you label your points, you are so much less likely to make a mistake. I know it's an extra second, but it's an extra second. That's worth it. Okay, so our slope is negative 4. Any questions on that one? Alright, now uh, kind of the, I guess, trickiest of them all is this right? where it says find the slope of the line passing through the point 51 with an x intercept of 4. Alright, so they gave us one point here, that's my first one. And they give me the, um, so if we think of our equation here. So they gave us an x, they gave us a y, right? And we're trying to find our slope here. What's the last variable? B. And what does B represent? Y. A y-intercept. Do they give us the y-intercept? No. no, they gave us the x-intercept. Well, if it's an x-intercept, what would my point be for an x-intercept? So just for a visual sake, I'm going to go ahead and plot it here. x-intercept of 4. Would you agree with me it's on the x-axis at 4? So what's that ordered pair then? Yeah, that's exactly it. Good. Four zero. So they're expecting you to be able to change that into the format of an ordered pair. Now we have two points. Now you can do your slope from there, just like we did last time. Questions on that one? Okay. Because we did a problem, you guys seem pretty good with slope. I'm not going to make you do another one with that. All right, our next one here says line P has an x-intercept of 5 and a y-intercept of 3. Find the slope of line. You can do this a couple of different ways. We just recognized that an x-intercept would have been the point 5, 0. What would your y-intercept be? What point would that be? Good, 0, 3. Or you can think of it as, in your equation, which variable represents your y-intercept? <coughs> y, the M, the X, and B. What represents your y-intercept of these four? B. So if they gave us the y-intercept is 3, then we know that B is going to be 3. So we can either do slope this way and then put it in your equation, or I already have B. They gave me that it's 3. And don't you agree that they gave us an x and a y? My y is 0. And the x value is 5. So now I can subtract my 3. Negative 3 equals m times 5. Divide by 5, and I now have my slope. So I have my slope is negative 3 fifths. I can, and it said to find the slope, so I find the slope. So a couple of different ways. Again, they're looking at, you can understand that concept, that an x-intercept can be written as an ordered pair, and a y. Alright, now for this next one, we are constantly amazed at how many of these problems 
people are still getting wrong. All you have to do, guys, is count with your finger the slope of this graph. But the mistake everyone makes is that they just pick whatever point they feel like. That falls in the middle of the block, and I see people pick that one and this one. Those fall in the middle of the block. Pick ones that cross your axis or your, uh, your pictures are perfect. So let's see if we can zoom in on this. You can probably see it a lot better than your page. So I want you to look at yours. So I want you to go ahead and take a look at your picture. And I want you to plot two points that you see cross perfectly. So I want you to go through in your graph. Actually, I want you to plot every single point you see crosses perfectly. Because that's the mistake I see. And so I want to come over. I'm going to come around and make sure we're plotting the correct points, the ones that cross perfectly. If you are having trouble finding where they cross perfectly, please come back to me so I can show you what we mean. Well, why don't you say something? <coughs> Guys, you should not be sitting there doing nothing. If you do not have the worksheet, get the worksheet. Worksheet two, your homework. All right, so I'm coming around to make sure we have the proper dots plotted. Okay. Oh, are you going too? Um, did you not get it in class yesterday? You didn't get it? Oh, or did you get the assignment from today? Charlotte, where did you put worksheet one that you copied? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so you guys are doing pretty good with this. Again, where it crosses perfectly, I want where it crosses exactly on the intersection there, not in the middle of the box. So we have here, here, and all right, so you can use any of these two points. You can use any of these two points to count your slope. So literally just use your finger and count. Or use your pencil and mark it and count. We go up one. Remember, it's rise over run. Then we go to the left. One, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, you have to rise like that before you can go run. Rise Alright, but which direction is this going? Is this going to be a positive slope or a negative slope? <coughs> negative. Yeah, it's going down, so we should have a negative slope. So I negative see. one six. Please don't try and figure out if it's negative or positive while you're counting it. Just get your numbers and then at the end check your line. A lot of times when you try and figure out, oh, I'm counting down so it's negative or up so it's positive, you wind up missing the fact that depending on which direction you count that they may both be negative which makes it a positive and it just gets messier so just your numbers and then look at the direction of the line after you have your numbers okay so you can use them in your calculator to help you check this you can either just put in a slope of negative one six negative one six x for your slope or just to match that it has the right general direction or since we know our y-intercept what should my b value be What's my y-intercept here? Kevin, head up, please. What's my y-intercept? One. So if my y-intercept is one, my b-value should be one. So if we punch this into our calculator, and again, make sure you keep parentheses around any fractions, particularly negative ones. Negative one divided by six, x plus one. 
in our graph, and we should see. Oh, I said something. Thank you. We should see that at Mendes. Again, you can use your calculator check so many of these problems. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Let's flip it over to the back side. Okay. So, again, we have to get it in the form y equals mx plus b before we can know what our slope is. So, for my equation here, what is the first step that I need to do? Uh, let's go with, yeah, we need to get in slope intercept form here. And Freddie, what's going to be my very first step? And then Kevin, you're going to be the next, you're going to tell me the next step after that. So Freddie, what's my first step to get the y by itself? Uh, minus 4. Good, minus 4x. Can I combine any of 20 and negative 4x? No, they're not like terms. All right, Kevin, what's my next step? Good, divide by 5. And you have to do your heart here. So we have a negative 4 fifths x and minus 4. All right, we can eliminate options based upon just the slope direction as well as the y-intercept. This is a negative slope, so which ones can I eliminate? I'll go with this top one. That has a positive slope. What else can I eliminate? Which one has a positive slope? Thank you, Rachel. The bottom right one. These both have positive slopes. So our negative slope ones are down to the our two left ones. Now, which one has a negative 4 y-intercept? The first one. So this is our answer choice here. To check to make sure you did it right, you can actually pick a point on your graph, the point 0, negative 4, and put that into your equation here. Get up 4 times 0 plus 5 times negative 4. Punch that in your calculator and you find it equals negative 20. Again, another way to check your answer. All right, we already did one where we counted our slope by hand. We've done one like each of these. All right, let's do these last two. Plot two points that lie on the line 3x plus 2y equals 10 and then negative 6 equals negative 4x minus 3y. Now you can get it in slope intercept form and graph it that way. That's one way to do it. Or since it's just asking for two points, you can just pick two x values and plug it in to find your y. For sake of time, I'm not going to continue with this. Uh, but I would recommend get it in this format, y equals mx plus b, and then just plot your y-intercept and use your slope to find another point. Doing the chart, you might end up with a fraction, um, and that's not as easy to plot. And a lot of times on the SOL, they say plot integer coordinates, which means that to be a whole number. All right, questions on that? Okay. So we're going to move on to our box and whisker plots. This is a statistics topic that you probably have not heard in a previous class. So we're breaking up our stats materials over our SOL review days as well as previous um, previous years. So this is worksheet four. We have an emergency pass for Jason to go to the restroom. All right, box and whisker. Raise your hand if you've seen this or heard of it before. We've got three. Perfect. Okay, so box and whisker plot is where we have a box with what look like whiskers, I guess, um, on the end here. A box and whisker plot is a way of graphing data. We, what you've done before in times past is you've probably done bar graphs, you have maybe done pie charts, 
with different percentages. Um, box and whisker pot is another way to display that. Okay. So this is something new, so I want everyone paying attention and taking notes as we go. Box and whisker pot, um, each piece is worth 25%. So from here to here, that's 25% of our data lies within there. So a quarter of all of our data is within that first whisker. Then in your next spot from our first box, another 25% lies within there. So another quarter of our data is represented in that box. So, so far I have half of my data. Well, if I'm halfway through my data, what's the middle of your data called? For mean, median, mode, and range, which of those represents the middle of your data? The median, right? So our median is at this point. Whatever value this is, this is your median. And that says it right here. This line shows the median. Okay. So, so far we have our, um, actually, and this is our very first value. What is that called? What's the lowest value called? Smallest value, lowest amount, minimum. Yes. Are we awake? No confirmation on that, Miss Miss Charlotte. I think we have a bunch of zombies in here. Possibly, it sounds like it. <laughs> or rather, lack there of sound. Just groans. All right. So this is our minimum. So our next chunk here is another twenty-five percent of our data. So we now have another quarter of our data is represented there. We have 75% of our data represented. Remember then, quartile and quarter. Quarter of mm -hmm. 25%. That's pretty easy percentage for you to remember. And then our last chunk here is our another 25%, the last quarter of our data. And if this is the highest value, what is that called? Thank you, Gabby. Maximum. So how could I find, they, we already have represented our median. Mode, you can't really tell from here because we don't know how often the number is repeated. But how could I find my range? What could I do to find my range? How do I find range? What is the definition of range? range on a graph are y values, but when we're dealing with a list of data, say I have, uh, say Gabby has two cookies, Rachel has five cookies, Freddie has eight cookies, somehow Aiden managed to get 12 cookies, and Kevin had 15. What is the range of the cookies represented? Here? Biggest number is part of it. The range. Biggest number. Range. Subtract. Good. You subtract your maximum and your minimum. So you do 15 minus 2. Tells you the range. How much is in between? That would give me a range of 13. So if I have my maximum and my minimum, I would just subtract those. And that would give me my range. All right? So from here, you can figure out what your max, your min is your median, and thus you can find your range. Now, you'll notice here it says quartile. I use the word quarter to represent it. Uh, so we have each one represents the first quartile, the second quartile, the third quartile, and the fourth quartile. Now, they have this unique word called the interquartile range. That's this right here. I need everyone to underline this interquartile range. That's the middle 50%. So it's your box. Your box is your interquartile range. So the two boxes give you your interquartile range. Okay. All right. Now notice it says a box and whisker plot can never tell you the mean. And that's the question they like to ask you on the SOL. They like to see if you can pull information from your diagram here. And they love to see if you, they'll give you answer choices and they'll say, what can you tell from this graph? And they'll say, the mean is 
and you say, ha ha, you can't tell the name from it because I'm tricky. All right, so let's take a look at number one. Mr. Andrews made a box and a whisker graph of the quiz grades of his chemistry class, which is the median quiz grade for the class. So how do I know what my median is? It's the middle one, good. And my middle value is what? 77, good, boom, we're done. I should see everyone writing this down. Now another thing they like to do is have you compare box and whisker plots. Great, right. so number two says the box and whisker plot shows the heights in centimeters of high school seniors compared to freshmen. Seniors are a little bit taller than the freshmen. You get a growth score. All right, and it says using the median as the measure, which is closest to the difference in heights between the freshman and senior years. Again, median is located where? Before you say answer, where is your median located? Come on, guys. The middle line. Let's go. My median here is 170, and this looks about to be like 165. And difference means we're going to do what? Add, subtract, multiply, or divide? Subtract. So what's the difference here? Rachel, go ahead. Very good. Five centimeters. Good. All right. Questions so far? Okay. So just a couple more. Um, now it asks about the range. Alberto made the box and whisker graph of height and inches of the members of his basketball team. What is the range of heights of the team members? So I want you now to do numbers three and number four. And number four and find the range. Remember, this is max minus mid. And I expect every single one of you is working on this as we go around and check to make sure you're doing it. You are struggling. Good. Raise your hand so we can come and help you. So we should all be calculating the range. What is the range for number three? What do we get? <coughs> Good, nine. Oh. Thank you, Emily. Um, what is our range for number four? Beautiful, 18. Awesome. All right, next. All right, uh, so again, they like to make you compare. So for number five, they ask you which has the greatest range. You have to find the range for all four of our box and whisker parts. You guys did pretty good that last one, though, so I'm not going to make you do that one. I will say that for your homework. Uh, all right, number six. The heights of each member of the four groups of a choir are represented in the box and whisker box. We have sopranos, altos, tenors, and bass. All right, so which group has the meeting with the greatest value? Freddie, what is the median for my soprano group? What did you say? For, so, for soprano, what's my median? <coughs> Number six, the soprano altos. Good, 65. And Jaylene, I haven't picked on you yet. What's my median for my alto group? Jonathan, I'm going to pick you for tenor, and Katya, I'm going to pick you for bass. All right, go ahead. Good, so my alto group has a median of 66. Jonathan, what about my tenor group? 68. Beautiful, 68. And Katya, what about my bass group? Good, 71. So which one has the mean with the greatest value? Bass, good. 
Now, I'll notice what they did nicely for you here is that they lined them all up perfectly where your 60s were all in a row, your 70s were on a row, and you could just look to see which one was over to the right the furthest. Be careful though, they might not always do that. Good. Alright, let's see what we have done. of the two pounds or two ponds on his ranch. The box and whisker plot summarized the lengths and, e and inches of the fish from each pond. All right, so we have the Taylor pond, we have the Willow pond. Now this is a typical type of question the SO likes to ask. The lengths of the fish from Willow pond have A, and you have to choose which answer choice is correct. Immediately before we even look at the data from their box and whisker plot, which answer choice can I eliminate? without taking a look at any information other than the fact that we have a box and whisker plot. C, why C? Good, you don't know anything about the mean from your box and whisker plot. That is what they do. They like to try to trick you with that. So immediately you can eliminate your mean. Alright? So we have then our answer choices are a greater, Willow Pond has a greater range than Taylor Pond. The median is equal to 12 inches. Or the lower quartile is equal to the lower quartile for Taylor Pond. Okay, so let's take a look at um, A. It says greater range than the lengths of those for Taylor Pond. Okay, so Willow Pond, my max is 18, my minimum is 5. So what would my range be? Almost. My maximum is 18 and my minimum is 5. What would my 13. range be? Good, 13. All right, so we need to compare that to my Taylor pond. 20 and 5. What would your range be here? Okay. So does it have, does Willow Pond have a greater range? Yeah. It has a smaller range, right? So be careful. They like to switch up the words greater and less than. So not that one. All right, so as Willow Pond has a median equal to 12 inches. Well, what's your median? 11. 11. All right, and then finally, our lower quartile is equal to the lower quartile of Taylor Pond. All right, so lower quartile is the smallest one, the first chunk here. And Taylor Pond goes from 5 to 9. And if we look, Willow Pond also goes from 5 to 9. So we have D as our answer for this. Questions on that? Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead, let's see. Let's move on to worksheet three. You guys seem to be doing pretty good with box and whisper plots. Let's do some more practice with, uh, with functions and being range of intercepts. So worksheet three is coming around to you. Worksheet three. And you'll notice your homework for tonight is to finish three and four. So we should see that next class you have all of three done and all of four done. So make sure you're going along now because I'm helping you do your homework. All right, is there anyone that did not get worksheet three? I need one more in the back. <laughs> All right. So, reviewing some stuff that we've done before. Box and whisker was new, but now we're back to review. All right. So, this is dealing with more of what we were doing just at the beginning. So, to know if it's a function, remember x values cannot repeat and go to different y values. All right. Also, we use the vertical line test here. We already talked about that. It needs to touch the graph only once for it to be a function. Now, again, some pointers that we talked about if on the SOL, um, they sometimes will ask, is it a function or is it not a function? They do try to use, when they use the word not, make it capitalized, bold, italicized, so make sure you're reading your questions carefully. Let's take a look at this first one here. I'm going to go into the one on the left. 
and I'm going to have you do the one on the right. So it says, which relation is a function? Right? And for it to be a function, I cannot have x's repeat. So x can't repeat and go to different lines. Okay. So I can use that as well as my vertical line test. Since I have two graphs here, let's go and do the vertical line test first and see what that feels like. So for B, is this a function? No. Okay. For D, is this a function? Yeah. It doesn't hit it anywhere twice. So I would say that D is the correct answer choice, but to make sure we didn't make a mistake, let's double check. C has four repeated going to two different numbers, so that is not an answer choice. And here we have negative three. Goes to two different answers. Oh, yeah. Five goes two. I didn't even notice that. All right. So I want you to now do the column that says you do. I want you to choose which one is a function while I grab my point. Again, you've got to raise your hand if you don't know what you're doing so we can come help you. Okay. All right, which one did we get? B? Do we agree? Or does anyone want to argue against Gabby? I didn't think anyone would want to argue against her. Good, B looks right. on that okay let's move on to the next part and i apologize the computer's gonna go a little bit slower now all right so using our vertical line test which of the following graphs appear to be a function left side which one is a function I would agree. B. Let me see if I can fix this here. If I take this and move it along B, it's the only one that doesn't hit it twice. Good. How about on the right side? What's your answer choice over here? The B again? Yes. You're right. If I take this and move it across, it does not hit it in two different spots. Good. Okay. Then on the next part of your paper. Which graph appears to show a relation that is not a function? A. a, good. Heck, that is a vertical line. That kills it. It immediately fails it right away. Whoop. Okay, how about on the right side? C. Good. Right. Let's move on to, yeah, the next piece there. All right, we already talked about domain and range sum, so I'm going to skip through a couple of these. <laughs> All right, these are good ones. So it says write the selected ordered pair in the box. Using the ordered pair shown, create a relation containing three <coughs> ordered pairs with a domain of negative one, two, and four. So this is one of those technology enhanced where you have to click and drag and move the answer choice into the box. Okay, so we need our domain to be negative one, two, and four. So I want Kevin to give me an answer choice. Emily, I haven't picked on you yet. And Drew, I haven't picked on you either. So I'm going to have Kevin, Emily, and Drew each give me an answer choice. Kevin, we'll start with you. Which ordered pair can I use? So my domain is what? X or Y values. Good. So I need an X value that has negative 1 or an X value of 2 or an X value of 4. So which of these would have one of those options? Yep, good. Four, negative two. Good, so that takes care of this guy. All right, Emily, go and give me another one. Good, two, three. So does each of my values here have to be in the X position? All right, and Drew, finish it out for us. Negative one, zero. Beautiful, negative one, zero. Awesome. 
And they did not tell you to put it in a certain order. You always want to go from least to greatest, but the SOL should accept it in any order. Okay. All right. Let's move on. You guys did pretty good with that. Okay, we did some with the range there. Okay, so now let's do some function notation evaluating. All right, evaluating. So turn in your packet to this page here. I think is it on the back? Okay, bottom of the back, or yeah, bottom of the back side. Function notation. So f of x is just another way of saying y. So it's y equals. When we have a number inside the parentheses, we are saying that number is x. Substitute in that value of x to find y. So we've talked about this quite a bit. It says, if f of x equals x minus 3 quantity squared plus 1, what is f of 6? Well, 6 is just representing my x value. So all I do is take 6 and put that in for x, wherever it is in my equation. So instead of x minus 3 quantity squared, I have 6 minus 3 squared plus 1. And then use your calculator to help you out. You should get it. Always use your calculator to help check your answers. What do we get? So we agree? Yeah. Good. And those are answers for us. So anytime that they ask for f of a number, you're just taking that value and putting it in. All right, so go and do this next one now. I want you to do this next one. f of x equals 8x plus 6. What is f of negative 1? this in, what do we get? Good, negative 2. You get negative 8 plus 6. Just your negative 2. Awesome. Alright, go ahead and do those next two below it. Punching those in. We have two different x's we have to put it in for, so you put it in for both of those. Make sure you use your parentheses. Don't forget your square. We get C and A. Here we get A and A. <coughs> for this first one here? The second one over here? What did we get for the second one? What was your guess's answer you got? Yeah, see? All right. Into our factor, do we agree that it's negative 2 times 3 squared plus 3 minus 5? Do we agree with that? Okay, so when I punch this in, I have negative 2 times parentheses 3 parentheses squared plus 3 minus 5. What do we get? Negative 20. So make sure we match it up. We have our negative 2 in front and we have minus 5. We 
see that? Good. Alright, I want to teach you a trick for evaluating. I think this is really helpful, definitely a time saver. Um, if you don't remember, it's fine. You don't have to use it on the SOL, but I think it's really helpful. You'll find that this is helpful for your Algebra 2 SOL as well. So let me make this a little bit larger. Okay, so in our, on our calculator, see this little button down here that says STO. That stands for store. What this allows you to do is store any var or any value in for your variables. So you know we have our X button right here. But when you just type in 2x squared plus x minus 5 into your calculator and hit enter, it gives you just a single number because it doesn't recognize as x as a variable unless it's in your y equals. But we can use this to our advantage because what we can do is actually store 3 in for x. So I want everyone on their calculator to type 3, STO button, store, and then x, just like that. 3, store to x, and hit enter. You'll find that now anytime you type X onto your home screen, it gives you the value of 3. So you can type into your calculator negative 2 X squared plus X minus 5. Notice all I did was typed in my exact equation there, right? When I do that, now that I've told my calculator, hey, guess what? X is 3. When you hit enter, your calculator calculates it with x is 3. So it saves a lot of heartache and issues with um, parentheses. When you have a negative fraction particularly, make sure that you um, it calculates it nicely for you. You don't have to worry about your parentheses there. So this is definitely a tool that's really helpful, and it can use it a lot for your evaluating. Um, if you have more than one variable, you can actually use your alpha button. Notice how we have alpha a b c d e f g you have the whole alphabet there so if i wanted to store let's say i needed the let's say that i had the problem and they'll do this where you're not sure how to simplify a squared b cubed over um a to the fifth now we know our properties of exponents and we'll review that again let's say you forgot it you could actually test each one of your answer choices by picking a value for A and picking a value for B and storing it into your calculator. So for example, I could say, okay, well let, if I didn't know my answer choice, I could just pick A equals, let's say two. So I do store, or two store and for alpha A. Now it automatically knows A is gonna be two. And let's say that I pick three for B. So I would pick 3, store for alpha B. Now anytime I punch in B, it's going to know that's 3. So then I could just literally type into my expression here, A squared, so alpha A squared, and then alpha B cubed. Oh, need that to actually be cubed. Divided by alpha a to the fifth, and I could compare that with each of my answer choices. Now, we know from our exponent rules that what you would do is subtract your exponents here, and you would get for your answer b cubed over a. That would be one of your answer choices, but you could check each of your multiple choice answers, and whichever answer choice matches your decimal here, you know that's your correct answer. So I could check to make sure I did it right by doing alpha b cubed, I have to get out of the exponent, divided by alpha a cubed. Please be aware when you do this though, the next time you use x, a, or e, or whatever it is, it will still Stay be that back. number. Mm -hmm. So do not go in and just enter an equation randomly without changing your x value or your a value because you're going to get the wrong answer. It right. doesn't actually mean x. It means whatever number you put in each x. So here we see that the answer choice that I thought was correct 
the correct answer, matched my original equation, and thus I know that's the correct answer. <coughs> now, you only want to use this to check or if you have no idea what you're doing because this obviously takes forever, and there's a lot of room for error if you type in the equation wrong. But when you're stuck, you have no idea what to do, you can use it as, an, as a way to get your correct answer without knowing what to do. Um, so that's one thing with the SOL, although um, it tests a lot of information with those multiple choice questions. You can a lot of times somehow figure your way to the correct answer if you forgot how to do it. And we'll keep showing you little tricks like this to help you out with that. Um, so as Ms. Charlotte said, in your calculator, it's B will now stay as 3, and A will, a will now stay as 2 unless you change it. So my X value, if I type in X right now, it's still going to be, what did I put in there, 6? Or sorry, 3. So when I do my next evaluating problem, I need to make sure I change it before I type it in. But when you graph, it will not mess up your graph because your calculator understands that x is a variable for your graph. Alright, any questions on that? Okay. Um, I think that's it that I wanted to on that. Let me double check real quick. I think I'm going to move on to the practice SOL now. Um, so just we'll real quickly talk about this. This is what you just had your test on. Remember, an x-intercept is where it crosses the x-axis. A y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. Um, so you can graph each of these to find your x and y-intercept. Um, but we've just recently done that on the last unit, so I won't waste your time with that. Okay, so I want you to pull out your practice SOL now. And we're going to go ahead and just do some problems through here. Like I said before, we'll just keep chipping away at this in class, these practice problems here. So this is, again, the SOL creators gave this to us and said, hey, this is similar to the SOLs that we give out. This is a great practice tool. And so we now are using it. All right, so take a look at our first sample problem, sample A. What is the solution to 3 times parentheses 2 x minus 1 equals 3? I want you to go ahead and try this on your paper. I want you to do the work on there and double check it with your calculator. Oh. So you're solving for x. This is what you learned back in October. God, you can go and move on to sample B. Just do those first, actually, those first three problems on the front page. Come around answering questions and then we'll go back over this. Please raise your hand and let us know if you are confused. We don't want to hear. we get for our answer choice for sample A? Good. X is 1, which is C. Good. Any questions on that one? You guys look like you're doing pretty good with that. Okay. Oh, did I lose my other sample problem? I lost sample B. So I'm just going to write sample B up here. It says, what is the value of 3 over x plus 2 when x equals 4? 
Alright, so we take 4, put it in, so we get 3 over 4 plus 2, which is 3 over 6, which gives us 1 half. Good. Again, this is another opportunity where you can just take 4, store it for x, and then do 3 divided by parentheses, x plus 2. It would give you 0.5, which we convert to a fraction. Make sure you read the directions. I think it said specifically to leave it in fraction form. Um, so you need to put in fraction. If it's a decimal, then it will be wrong. You lose an easy point there. Good. All right, that next one. So this is going back to the very first unit that we did back in September, back when you had no idea who I was and I had no idea who you were. Which expression represents four less than half a number n? Rachel, what did you say? D, do we agree? I heard Gabby agrees. Emily agrees. How about the rest of us? Yep. Jason agrees. So remember it says four less than half the number. When it is just less than, we know it's going to be subtraction, but what do we have to do? When we have just less than, what do we have to do with these guys? We're subtracting them, yes, but there's something about the order of them. We have to switch it. Good cocktail. When it says less than, that means subtraction, and we have to switch the order. So half a number would be 1 half times n, or n over n, minus 4. If it said is less than, what would that be? What symbol does that represent? Is less than. What symbol is that? Is less than. If it was just is, what is it? I said 5 is x. What symbol does that represent? Equal. Good. Thank you, Jonathan. So if it's instead of equal is less than, what symbol does that represent? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Is less than represents an inequality. So when it's just less than that subtraction where we flip flop, is less than represents that. Okay. Flip it over. Let's do one, maybe two more, depending on the type of problem. Um, I don't want to do the radical yet. We're going to say that for another day. And so I don't want to do that radical either. I feel like I'm losing every other problem. <coughs> I am losing every other problem, aren't I? Okay. Let's see, which one do I want you to do next? Ooh, let's have you do number two, that factoring one. Let's see if you guys can remember that. Number two. So flip the page over. I'm going to write it up on the board since I apparently lost it. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, I know why. It's on the bottom of the page. I feel really foolish right now. Okay, hold on. Allow me to scroll down. This one. <laughs> Let's see if you can remember how to factor. It's factoring. First of all, what's my GCF? One. Good. So there's nothing to factor out with my GCF. So we can move straight to our T chart. For a t chart, and we need what multiplies to give me negative six, but adds to give me negative one. What accomplishes that? <laughs> Which two numbers accomplish the t chart? Good, two and negative three. Good. So, can I take the shortcut? Yeah. So, x plus two times x minus three, they ask for the factor which is in parentheses, so which one's our answer? Yeah. Have a wonderful weekend. Remember, JLab 20 questions is due next class, as well as finishing worksheet 3 and worksheet 4. Use an online graphing calculator. If you do not have one at home, and if you need to trade back, please do so. Thanks, Jason. You might be Yes, yeah, so you need to bring it back next class and you can trade.
and you can use it while you're in class here, but we have to keep it to get it ready for the SLR. Thank you. Jonathan, you did much better today. Thank you for your participation.